Hey you and welcome, my name is Mike and in this old video I have a story for you. Uh, a story that is like pure kind of insanity. Which it, which means it has it all. Cannibals, killers, crossbows, what more do you need? You know, right there, that's a triple D. A man, a Steve to be precise, he was hardcore, he was dork. He was goth to the extreme. With a sick and twisted mind. Of course, that's like what he definitely wanted people to think. He wanted everybody to think he was as dark as can be, he was ultra goth. And then it became one of those like self-fulfilling uh, prophecies when women around the city of Bradford in the UK started disappearing. Control, push the wrist up to the neck and snap. And here's something else. Crossbows are like the weapon of choice. For so many folks, it's kind of baffling, which, which we will get into. Now, let's give it a go. This whole story unfolds, unravels. Definitely unravels, like the minds in this video. They unravel, like my mind is unraveling, in the city of Bradford, England, which is in West Yorkshire. West Yorkshire! No accent this time. Quite exciting, really. It's known for its wool. Yep, that's its identifying quality. It is the wool capital of the world. Look at you. It is a wealth of museums, parks, shopping strips, and theaters galore. The culture in Bradford is nothing short of expansive, and its population is just over half a million. Bradford is known for a lot, and has a lot. Something for everyone. But moving on to the case now. Well, actually, before I do, I cover a good few cases from England and, like, the UK, but you, did you ever notice that the vast majority of them are from, like, Yorkshire, West Yorkshire, around the, those parts? Hmm. Yorkshire, aka British Florida. Now we can move on. On the morning of May 24th, 2010, a Monday, 53-year-old Peter Gee showed up to work at an apartment complex, Homefield Court, where he had been employed as a caretaker for the previous three years. He started his you know, regular routine, which is reviewing video footage from the CCTV cameras you know, in his apartment complex, reviewing the, what was going on over the weekend. And he crack. Anybody up to no good? As he sat there with his coffee, or more likely his, his cuppa, right? He was reviewing the footage and scanning through, scanning, scanning through the stuff when he kind of like did a double take. He spat out his D. That was when he got to the night of Saturday, which is May 22nd. He was kind of like zoning out, and then he saw something he will never be able to unsee. On the screen before him, he watched as a young woman ran down the corridor, seemingly terrified, coming up behind her a man with a crossbow. He aimed, fired, and missed. He shot again, and this time he hit the woman through the head. She was lifeless. That man was 40-year-old Stephen Griffiths. Stephen then spotted the CCTV footage, realizing he'd been caught, and rather than try to destroy the camera or the footage, he turned to face the camera and held up the crossbow in what could only be described as a toast. Then, Stephen was seen dragging the woman by her legs back into his apartment. He returned with a drink in his hand, held it up, and then flipped the camera the bird. The footage next showed him coming and going with bags after bags, which were later found out to be pieces of his victim. Uh, Stephen Griffiths. Bit of a character, as you can probably tell. He also went by the name Ven Pariah, which is... Wow. You ever encounter people who are just like, you know, I'm dark. Guys, just so you know, I am, I am dark. I am goth. That's this nutsack in a nutshell. By the way, just a little kind of tangent, I noticed using a crossbow, pretty common in the UK. They, they love them some crossbows over there. In April 2019, a retired lecturer named Gerald Corrigan was watching TV late one night, this was in Anglesey, Wales, when all of a sudden the TV lost signal. Now, Gerald lived in a very remote part of Anglesey, very close to the water, and so maybe, you know, the winds had picked up and knocked out his satellite dish or something like that. So we thought, you know, maybe it's something to do with the satellite, you know, on top of his house, whatever. Really dark outside, but he's like, you know, I'll go out and have a go. Uh, and he did so. He walked outside to look, you know, at the cables and shit. How did TVs work? I don't know. He was promptly shot with a crossbow and died. The investigation would determine it was sports therapist Terry Wall who had killed the man. Okay, so our breathing, we'll put the breathing in in a second. But what we're going to do now is we're just going to open the lungs up. All angles, okay? Arms cross, 
and you step out, so you're facing 45 to the corner. Police were led to Terry as he was one of the 17 people on Anglesey who had purchased a crossbow in the last 10 years, and crossbows, they are controlled items. A car was also later found burnt out, suspiciously. Now this car belonged to Terry's partner, but she was out of the country at the time it was destroyed. The car's GPS showed it had been near Gerald's home the night of the murder. And then, of course, it was determined he had purchased the same crossbow bolt and crossbow as the murder weapon. His Amazon history pointed out there were only two people who made that purchase, and the other fella quickly discounted. It appeared that Terry tampered with Gerald's satellite dish the night off, and then ambushed him outside. For that, he got 31 years. A motive has never been proven. Never proven, but it was suggested that Gerald Corrigan was a victim of fraud to a local fella. He'd given him like £250,000 to do some work for him, work which was never done. When Gerald came around asking for his money back, the guy didn't take too kindly to that. And so this guy then hired Terry Wall, who was also in debt by about £50,000. Terry Wall was hired to murder Gerald Corrigan. It's never been proven, but that's what the rumor mill seems to be. The whole story actually of Terry Wall and Gerald Corrigan, it's really wild. Um, as you can see in his videos, which he posts on YouTube of him doing sports therapy, Terry was originally from London. and His alibi for the night um, of the murder of Gerald Corrigan, his, his alibi to the police was that he was having sex with a guy in a field. Now, Terry was married to a lady, but then the guy Terry claimed he was having sex with came forward and said, I've never met Terry in my life. So it's kind of a strange alibi. But uh, yeah, Terry was arrested, is imprisoned, and no kind of real reason as to why he murdered this guy with a crossbow has ever been found. Or how about in 2021 when Marcel Melinte in Southampton shot a man in his own backyard in the head with a crossbow? Once again, no real motive. Um, some people have come forward and said either the victim or Marcel were pressuring the other to sell drugs. Some people were saying Marcel was pressuring the victim, the other people say victim was pressuring Marcel, and so Marcel was like, hey, listen, I'm going to sort this out with a crossbow to the head. I see it. The victim somehow managed to survive the attack, even with a freaking crossbow bolt sticking out of his dome. And Marcel was later arrested and sentenced to 18 years for attempted murder. But again, kind of no real motive, so I guess it's kind of just seen as crossbows are kind of like the one ring from Lord of the Rings. You're just driven mad when you see them, and you have to use them. And before we continue, let me just let you know that today's video is sponsored by Factor. What's Factor? I hear you're barking, big dog, big hungry dog. Factor cuts out stressful meal planning when it's chef-prepared, ready-to-eat meals. Yum yum. How does it work? Let me answer, because you're gonna wanna sign up today. Every week, you have more than 34 dietitian designed meals with gourmet chefs prepping them. And from there, it's straight to you, ready to eat. All their meals are fresh. Fresh, I say, never frozen. It's like what I say at the bar, you know, I want some ice, give me some fresh ice. No, no, not frozen and crap. And guess what? You doing keto, locale, vegan, vegetarian? Factor's got the right one for you. Listen here, looking at foods and all that, old calorinos, friggin' vitamins, my diet, carbs, who has time for that? Exactly right, nobody has time for that. Why be counting like a nerd when you could be eating? Factor agrees. That's why they have dietitians brainiacs over there doing the number crunching for you to make sure their meals are to the highest quality, backed by good old science. They also have add-ons like smoothies, shakes, shots, yummy. To get one of them exclusive deals just for you and your tummy, use my link down below, scan this QR code, and use code CHAPTERMAR50 to receive 16 free meals and free dessert for life while your subscription is active. Thank you so much to Factor for sponsoring this whole video. You're gonna be in good, healthy, and easy with my boy Factor. Now back to Stephen Sean Griffiths, who was born in December 24th, Christmas Eve, 1969. Nice. Born though on Christmas Eve, does that mean he only gets one present instead of two? That might drive anybody mad. Born in Dewsbury, Yorkshire to Stephen Griffiths Sr. and Moira Dewhurst. Stephen was the eldest out of three children. His parents' marriage came to an end and they divorced, leaving all three children in his mother's care. This was a bad idea. See Moira, the mom, she was eventually convicted of benefit fraud, by the way, which is the least of her kind of sucking ass, quite literally. Um, because Moira, much like her son, bit of a character. Kind of one of those situations where you're, it's no doubt Stephen grew up a little, a little messed up in the head, a little 
sick and twisted mind. See, aside from her benefit fraud, the little scheme she had going on, uh, neighbors would claim that Moira often brought men home to the house and would have sex with them in the backyard, in full view of all of the neighbors. I mean, listen, when this was happening, maybe there really was nothing on TV, so at least she was putting on a show. But if the neighbors saw it, you can imagine Stephen definitely saw it too. Stephen's childhood definitely gives Jeffrey Dahmer vibes. You know, this guy had issues from an early age. He often bragged to classmates that he killed and skinned birds and tortured other animals. But his most serious offenses happened at the ripe age of 17. While being caught shoplifting at a local department store, Stephen lashed out at the security guard with a knife, striking him. This cost him three years in youth custody, where it stated he lost all contact with his family. He told officers like during this time that he often fantasized about kind of like killing, torturing people, and he did say he would be a serial killer by the time he was 30. It's important to set goals. Less than a year after his release in 1989, he was arrested once again for possession of an air pistol, which he claimed he was just using to shoot birds and stuff, you know, no big, just birds, lads. It's not like I'm kind of working my way up. In 1991, he was officially diagnosed as a sadistic schizoid psychopath. In 1992, he was arrested again for holding a knife to a woman's throat. It's two years right there. He later enrolled in university and managed to get a degree. Make it make sense. He's a sadistic psychopath who was kind of just let roam free, uh, as you do. Um, and then he went and got himself a degree. He started doing even a PhD. So how does this make sense? Oh wait, it will. Because when you find out what he did, his, he was doing his studies in PhD in, guess what? Homicidal tendencies. I don't think he needs a degree in that, I think he's got it down. An ex-girlfriend would come forward like, later on and say, Stephen, he could be sweet, oh, but also a bit odd. He would sleep with cotton balls in his ears because he didn't want bugs to get in, which is like, okay, I mean, maybe he grew up with, in a very filthy household. Doesn't sound like his mom was great. So, you know, maybe he had like spiders crawling in his ears when he was a kid and that kind of traumatized him. All right, fair enough. Also though, she would say that in his apartment, his furniture was all covered in plastic. Even the carpet. I mean, the resale value alone, you gotta think about that, I guess. I'll give him that. Although maybe he also just didn't want to get blood on it. Because another girlfriend after this one would say he was violent and controlling. One time she went out to a nightclub without him, so he headbutted her in the face. It was after she left him for beating the shit out of her. That's when neighbors said he started slicking back his hair, wearing long ass trench coats, donning that real goth look with eyeliner even, and getting pet lizards and walking them on leashes in the neighborhood. He's so cringe, it kinda rocks. One former friend recalled Stephen showing him his lizards and how he fed them live rats. Then, to his friend's absolute dismay and shock, Stephen was like, check this out. Picked up a baby rat himself, a live one, gobbled it down. Gobbled it away, washed it down with a glass of water. Hardcore. And during all of this time, he created an online pseudonym for himself on good old MySpace. Remember them days? I don't. MySpace is even older than me. His username, though, was then Pariah. He often posted dark and twisted quotes, like I said, he was extremely goth. Some of notable serial killers and fictional killers from movies and books. One night, he posted, What will the pseudo-human do, one wonders? Poor Stephen pretended to be me, but he was only the rapping. I knew towards the end that I supplied the inner core of iron, hatred bound tightly in flesh. At very long last, the time has come to act out. It was in June 2009 that Stephen became kind of restless with lizards, eating live rats, reading books about murders. He was like, you know what? Listen up. I've done enough academia. It's time to get to, to the practical. His dark desire to act out his murderous tendencies kind of like fully won him over. And so he headed to Bradford's red light district. There he met 43 year old Susan Rushworth. Susan had three children of her own and unfortunately weathered the wrong path in life after her marriage broke down and she was introduced to drugs. Her mother had tried to help her by paying for her to go to rehab, but she always seemed to find herself back in the lifestyle of sex trafficking and, and drugs. And she had suffered a brain hemorrhage which led to her developing epilepsy. According to Susan's mother, Christine, that was the catalyst that threw her into the life of, of sex work and drugs. Around the time she went missing, she was living with her mom and trying to clean herself up. She told her mom one day if she was headed to the store, she'd be right back. Of course, she was never back. Police interviewed locals and even drained a nearby lake. Her bank cards and phone were never used again, and, and so foul play was, was suspected. Susan's remains have never been found. In April 2010, 
31-year-old Shelly Armitage went missing from the same district as Susan did. Also a sex worker and a mother of two, Shelly had turned to sex work as a way to fuel her drug addiction. The last interaction she had with her family was the very day she went missing. She just happened to run into her parents there while she was out shopping, yapping away, then she, she, she left and that was it. Her boyfriend reported her missing when she didn't come home that night and she never went to collect her security payment. Stephen reportedly killed Shelly with his good old trusty crossbow in his apartment before dismembering her and he filmed the entire thing on his phone. Then he bagged up her remains in just like plastic bags, took it on a bus like public transport before dumping it, disposed of it in a local river. But this is kind of how brace he was, he was filming it all, just you know, on the bus. Oh, don't mind me with my bag full of person. But funnily enough, this dipshit then lost his phone, that he'd filmed the murder of Shelly. He lost the phone. He just happened to just fell out of his pocket or something on the bus. It was found. People, a good few people saw the video before passing it on to the police. However, by the time it was turned over to the police, it wouldn't be in time to stop his final victim, which was just over a month after Shelly Armitage disappeared. The footage that was recovered from the phone, by the way, uh, allegedly it showed Shelly hogtied in Stephen's bathtub. My sex slave was written on her back in black ink. It was May 2010 that 31 year old Suzanne Blaine Myers would be Stephen's next and final victim. The street name she went by was Amber. She had been introduced to drugs early and by 21 was using sex work to support her habit. Before Suzanne had been introduced to drugs, she had been, you know, just a regular happy woman who had studied to be a nurse, but it had all gone downhill from there. It was thought that Suzanne and Shelley, who lived only a couple of streets away from each other, had been friends. Suzanne was the girl that Peter Gee witnessed on his apartment complex CCTV that Monday afternoon. She bravely made a run for freedom out of Stephen's apartment, only to be shot down with a crossbow in the hallway and dragged back in to Flat 33. Considering he now had killed two within a month's time, it's, it was would have been pretty soon before the next one. He was obviously escalating and escalating. It was his dream to become a serial killer. And um, yeah, sometimes just don't follow your dreams. Dreams, let dreams just die, die a death. It's actually been suspected that Steven killed before. He's he's kind of like sort of, sort of kind of been suspected of killing up to six, six women. Every time he's in question about this, he refuses to talk, but he has said he has killed loads. How much is a load? It's not that surprising though, given his track record. It's almost like he became bored and started killing, you know, because he had nothing better to do. And it's also not like he was hiding it. Everybody who knew him was like, oh yeah, wow, you know, he's a, he's a killer, he's a serial killer. <sighs> not surprising at all. He was eating rats in front of his, in front of his buddies. He was posting shitty quotes online. But then in other pictures, he looks like the most normal fella ever. Look at him, he's having some crack. He even took body parts on public transportation in bags, filming it all on his phone. Not expert hidden serial killer, he was not. And then given the middle finger to a security camera. Oh, he's hardcore. Steven finally got the ultimate attention when the cops slapped him with bracelets. Steven was arrested the same day Peter Gee witnessed the CCTV footage on May 24th, 2010. After witnessing the horrific murder on the camera, Peter immediately called the police. This was around 1 p.m. Police arrived and arrested him shortly afterward. And, and Stephen went willingly. He was almost like, you know, what took you so long? He was kind of just sitting there. Like, I mean, he, he knew he'd been captured on CCTV on Saturday night, but so I guess from then till when he was arrested on Monday, he was like, where are they? Then when they arrested him, he was like rambling, claiming he was Bin Laden. <laughs> so like, what? At the same time though, his apartment was also like mid cleanup. Like, um, you know, there was bleach everywhere. The carpet, had, which was covered in blood, had, was in the process of being torn up. His trusty crossbow, though, right smack dab on the couch, pride of place. I guess the dismemberment he had done right after he had murdered Suzanne, well, that had left quite a mess. So I can only imagine he, for his first thought, was like, I'm going to be arrested any minute now. And then probably by the time Sunday evening came around, he was like, I'm not arrested. Better start cleaning. Are you, are you saying that you've killed Susan Rushworth? Yes. And what was the other name? Shelley Armitage. Are you saying that you've murdered Shelley Armitage? Yes. And then the last one? Susan Blamer. Right. Are you saying you've murdered her? 
Yes. Okay, well, thanks for that, Steve. I appreciate you telling us that, and it's, it's important. What were you setting things on fire for? Well, to destroy DNA. But like I say, in such a reckless, crazy manner, I can't believe, mind you, I don't know, I think, like I said, Caretaker perhaps had other things on his mind, but otherwise I can't believe, you know, with the, the smoke that must have been billowing out of the windows. Although I did keep them shut for a while as well, so that's why I got a lot of soot all over me, and eventually I got a breathing mask on. So, how would you know that the fire destroys DNA? Well, to be perfectly honest, I mean, that was something I always kept uh, meaning to check up on on the internet, but um, it was just an assumption that, uh, well, certainly I think the principle I operated on was, well, it certainly isn't going to enhance the quality of the evidence. In his interview with the police, he was rather flippant about the murders, showing zero emotion, zero remorse, stating, I'm misanthropic. I don't have much time for the human race. Guys, it's too dark. And what sort of location have you put them in? If you can't tell us where, what sort of location have you put them? I don't know. Where a robot, where a computer would put them. Yeah, you know, a rational, emotionless aberration would put it. What, why did you feel the need to, to kill her? I don't know. That's like deep issues inside me. <laughs> So why did you feel the need to kill any of the girls? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I'm misanthropic. I don't have much time for the human race. He was, however, very compliant with the police, giving the police kind of any answers they wanted, minus giving away the location for Susan Rushworth's body. DNA of all three victims, known victims that is, was found on his stove and in his bathtub, despite his best efforts to clean them up. He told police that he had cooked and ate part of his victims, and his last victim, he ate parts of her raw. I can imagine when he was eating or nibbling or whatever, maybe he wasn't even doing that, he just, he just put the food near the stove. I can imagine when he was doing that, he was thinking, man, this is gonna freak out the cops so much. When asked police, like, why did you do, what was your motive? You know, why did you decide to become a killer? Ah, uh, he had no good answer to that question. Really, the only one thing he said was that when you kill, you kill parts of yourself. I don't know if I was... So, just... Sometimes you kill someone to kill yourself, or kill parts of... I don't know, I don't know. There's easy, easier ways to do it than that, pal. His anger and violence against women, sex workers, likely stems from his mommy issues. I mean... She was getting it on in the garden. Not long after his arrest, a woman found a rucksack nearby in the river. It was the decapitated head of Suzanne Blaymeyers. The bolt from the crossbow was still lodged in her head. All in all, police recovered 81 pieces of Suzanne from the river. At trial, Stephen pleaded guilty to all counts. No, no messing about. Well, okay, maybe a little, little messing about. Because when he was like on the dock and they asked for his name, he gave the crossbow cannibal. Just more proof he was in it for the whole coolness factor, what he thought was cool. He showed no remorse or expression while victim impact statements were read. He scowled often and crossed his arms in a statement of indifference. Psychiatrists that assessed Stephen for the trial went on record to say he was mentally fit and fine, just obsessed with murder, which is wild. Okay, we're gonna need to invent a stronger word than obsessed because this is <laughs> woof. But hey, other than that, he has a great head in his shoulders. Regardless, it took two hours to have it all done and dusted with. Stephen was given three life sentences, and the judge said he will never, ever, ever see the light of day. Prison life has been hard on poor old Stephen. He's serving out his sentence at HMP Longlart in Worcestershire. He's attempted to take his own life several times, and was even found unconscious with a sock around his neck. In 2011, he went on a 10-month hunger strike, where police statements said his organs were shutting down and he had barely moved from his bed. In 2019, he was attacked by another prisoner who got a sharp piece of wood and just stabbed him through the chest. Stephen was rushed to hospital and unfortunately he <coughs> survived. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, it means a lot to me as always. So, you know, 
uh, yeah, you know. <laughs> um, here, listen, please check out the That Chapter podcast if you're looking for more That Chapter, which has a new episode out every single Monday. But until the next old video, which will be in a couple of days, please take care of each other and yourselves. Because I love you, Mike.